Welcome to the 10th Amazing Race Canada recap episode of the UR Team Number Podcast. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is one guy from the Okanagan who is at least as graceful as a llama, maybe even a zebra, Logan Saunders. Evening. You can at Twitter's, as always, using the hashtag Yattencast, or email us at yattencast at gmail.com. Or, you know, like all the videos and all the SoundClouds and everything like that. Yeah, retweet, share, favorite, respond. Is that one of them? Yeah, you can do. And if you really want something to retweet our favourite, go for uh, Nick's sassy um, slash flirty tweet to me in the past six hours. What? Which I don't know if you've seen, Logan. <laughs> I woke up to this in the past sort of half an hour. I sent him um, one of the screen grabs that we're using, which is him wakeboarding and looking supremely attractive. And he replied, <laughs> Darn, I guess I lost my chance with you. Wow. I really hope Nick and Matt win. Just, they had a very fun week, at least. And also, before anything else, if you're following the pool, ha 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 ha, bitches, I'm winning. You're in first of your own pool? Isn't that, isn't that bad etiquette, Michael? (laughs) I'm first by 11 points now as well, because Eamon and Michelle had a shocking week. What, they scored zero or something? They scored one each. They got Gino and Jesse in first place. Well, that was a given. Yeah. But uh, you scored six, I scored the entire 15 points, and they scored one. But it's still all to play for. You could still actually technically be in first place next week. Speaking of polls, can we talk about the Feel Your Favourite contest on the CTV website for for the Amazing Race? If we must. Right now, Gino and Jesse are in first with 90,000 votes. Dean and Amanda somehow, the invisible team of the season, in second with 70,000 votes. And then everyone else is 25,000 votes or lower. So I implore all listeners out there to put aside all of our bicker tinning and all the arguing, all the drama, and just endorse Dana and Amanda in the polls and make sure they finish first to beat out Gino and Jesse. Because, believe it or not, if the Volta Mussolini's win the fan favorite poll, the next season, James Duffy, this is true, James Duffy will replace John Montgomery as the host, and the pit stop greeter at the end of each leg will be a rotation of one of the co-hosts from the social. So a vote for Gino and Jesse is essentially a vote to disrupt and strip the show of its entire soul and integrity and its spirit. And teams will only be allowed to check in when they complete a trivia question from one of the harpies of the social. Yes, and BMO will be there to help. As always. As always, yes. So, previously five teams raced from Calcutta to Delhi, where local traditions had teams flopping, dropping, and rapping. Gino and Jesse and Nick and Matt went head-to-head at the detour, with Nick and Matt winning out, and they won the leg as well. Brent and Sean peaked their way through the leg and came in last, but were saved by the last non-elimination of the race. And teams must now fly to Penticton, BC, and find the D'Angelo Estates Winery to pick up their car and the next clue. And what do they have for this leg on their card, Logan? 550 American dollars. You said it wrong. It's 550 dollars. American! Yeah, yeah. wrap Wrap your head around that one. I promise that might be the last time this season I do a Jan impression. I love how they're going through the Okanagan and they're still getting American dollars. Probably because they had to pay for a taxi to get to the airport and to pay for their food that they're inevitably going to buy in the layover in Tokyo. But that is a very large amount of money for a leg when when they're self-driving. Yeah, because gas prices, this is back in May, so gas prices would have been uh, pretty low at that point around here. Yeah, it just doesn't make that much sense to me, but... If you consider that they did give away all their monies at the end of the last leg, it kind of makes more sense. I mean, the Okanagan is an expensive place to try and get around on a vacation, but it's but it's not that expensive. Come on. And we had Nick and Matt departing at 10.16pm, uh, Gino and Jesse at 10.23, Simi and Opie at 11.18, Dijon and Leolani at 11.20, and Brent and Sean at 11.37. Yes, and Gino and Jesse, I believe, refer to the Okanagan as Canada's comfort zone. And somehow it's not a reference to the TD Bank, because TD Bank loves the comfort zone. And first up was an active rate info, which I don't believe you will have seen yet, Logan. Not in the Amazing Race franchise, but I have seen it in the Mall Australia, I believe. This is a uh, 
a challenge that was coined in Amazing Race Australia 2. It was their opening challenge. Teams opening to, challenge? Yes, teams had to get a ferry which only one team could get on each each time and do a version of this one where instead of clearing a path through the maze to get their car through, they had to actually get their car out of the maze so they could only move their car forward and backwards as well. Hmm. And as you'd imagine, with 11 teams doing this, it got a little bit chaotic, which I think is kind of the idea. Yes, this wasn't quite uh, that bad. All, all the, the only real drama with this task was Simeon Opie and the Bolden Mussolini's taking turns moving the same car. Yeah. So in this active route info, teams must move the black cars forwards and backwards only to clear a path for their own white cars to move through. Once their car is through the kind of maze, I suppose, more slide puzzle, they can continue on to Summerland Water Resorts where they'll find the next clue. And caution, double U-turn ahead. I think this mini game has about a thousand different names online because it's a popular... Uh, I remember back in the day there used to be a site I used to use all the time during elementary school, and it was called Game Rival. And I, I know it hasn't been around for about a good six or seven years now, maybe even longer, but back then I used to play on Game Rival all the time, and I think they had a game called that was exactly like this. I think they called it Traffic Jam, but I think I ended up coming across the same game on other websites, and they just come up with alternate names for it. So I'm sure it, it's like... A, it's like uh, Christmas time when people play uh, the the white elephant game, and then they come up with uh, three or four different names for it as well. But they're all essentially the same thing. Also, where did the uh, reflective vests come from? Because only uh, Gino and Jesse and Simi and Ovi actually wore them. I was sort of watching out for this. Nick and Matt didn't bother with them, and uh, neither did Dijon, Leilani, or Brent and Sean. They're just not reflective people, I guess. Having said that, Nick and Matt were both wearing bright coloured t-shirts, so you could kind of not miss them. Yeah, I don't know what the purpose behind that was. No, neither do I. Was it just for visual purposes? But then if two teams are wearing the same reflective outfit, then that, you know, that... Cancels each other out. That cancels each other out, so... Maybe teams are given the option to use it, so they don't run over other teams? Who knows? Hey, it's one way to get an advantage in the race, isn't it? Yeah, just, you know, do the old Brazilian taxi driver method and, uh, you know, instead of rolling over Shola and Dwayne's ankles, uh, you you uh, run over Gino and Jesse's ankles. Gino and Jesse, you're the first team to arrive, but I'm sorry you've incurred a penalty for trying to run Nick and Matt over. <laughs> yes. And then not stopping and reversing back over their heads. The flatliners. <laughs> the flatliners flatlined. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if they don't go out in fourth place, I'm not going to get to use that pun, and I'm going to be very disappointed in a way. Although I do it's... thoroughly want them to win. They need to have Dave Ball to comment when that happens and say, Nick and Matt got flatlined by the flatliner. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> so Nick and Matt are the first to leave the active route info, and they do it in four moves. Brent and Sean leave in second in five moves. Gino and Jesse in third with 14 moves. Simi and Opie in fourth with 17 moves. And then Dijon and Leilani in last with 27 moves. Having that many moves is good on the dance floor, but not in a truck maze. But Did you notice that when uh, Brent and Sean and Gino and Jesse were fighting for second place on the way to the roadblock, Brent and Sean called Gino and Jesse the brothers? Well, they're the only other brothers besides them, so I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah, but and nicknaming another team who are also the same relationship as you with that relationship is a bit weird. Well, it's like in real life when I meet another person named Logan, I don't refer to them as, like, other people, if there was two Logans in the same room, they would just say, oh, you know, Logan H and Logan S. Or Logan A. Logan 1. Yeah, Logan A? <laughs> that sounds too way too Canadian. Um, it's Logan A. Eh? But if it's just me and another person named Logan in the room, then I'm not going to call them by their initial, I'm just going to call them by their name. So I can see from Brett and Sean's perspective that they don't have to really distinguish between uh, multiple sets of brothers. And once teams got to the water resort, it was the roadblock we were predicting. Uh, who wants to get wet? And it doesn't involve Jeff and Jackie. <laughs> How did I know a Jeff and Jackie joke was coming? <laughs> and in this roadblock, one team member must learn the sport of wakeboarding can complete a two-part course. In the first part, they must ride over a sliding ramp and stay up for three seconds before heading to the second part, which is a jump, which they must clear. They don't actually have to stay up after the jump to receive their next clue. 
I'm just happy for the teams because ever since leaving the D'Angelo Estates, they didn't have to worry about any one-hit wonder crappy R&B music to be played over the past hour. About that. And it was Nick, Sean, Jesse, Simi, and Leilani doing the roadblock. And I know I said this last week, but Monty is a massive show-off. One hand. One hand. Did he jump over a shark? Did he Did he go... Uh... Did he go Fonsty? He basically did. He both showed off with that, doing one-handed on wakeboarding, which may I point out, having done wakeboarding is very difficult. And also he um, flipped the tyre in the detail with one hand as well, just to prove he can. Maybe his other hand was sore. Maybe he could, like, he would use both hands if he could, but he, uh, I don't know, broke his hand... uh... Uh, maybe with the Devin Soldik was getting jealous and I don't know, just trampled over one of Montgomery's hands with a horse, or you know, Monty tried a yoga move and it didn't go quite right. So yeah, he's he's down to one hand. Well, maybe he broke it in a fight with He-Man. And surprisingly, Sean is the first person to clip the first part. Say what? Yeah, but he has no upper body strength. Exactly. Sean actually did very well at this. And then we get all the pratfalls and the awfulness. Lots of face plants. Lots of I face plants. I think a couple of Nick's falls were particularly amusing. And the face plant that Lilani does once she, she succeeds after 20 attempts was rather amusing as well. Yeah, the the one where Nick fell face first and then the uh, the handle kind of sprung back. That is very familiar to me, given that on one of my last attempts on when I went wakeboarding, they, because I was on a cable rather than on a speedboat, because it was in the sulfur keys in the docks, they um, accidentally, instead of slowing it down to bring me in, they pulled it harder. So they basically nearly dislocated both of my shoulders. Ouch. Yeah, that was not fun. I should note, I would have done amazing at this wakeboarding task. Okanagan Lake is my lake, bitches, and quite frankly, uh, I wouldn't have needed any hands. In the same way that uh, Alex Trebek keeps um, keeps Lake Ramsey as his. Yeah, yeah, Alex Trebek is to Ramsey Lake what I am to Okanagan Lake. Yeah, if we were doing uh, doing this on the Amazing Race, you would so have taken this task. What can I say? I, I like to get wet. <laughs> you know, you learn something about me on the podcast each week, Michael. I think we knew that a while ago. And in the first piece of the editors trying to get us to not like Gino and Jesse, Brent uh, expressed a wish for Jesse to fall, 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 which is nice to see. Yes, and then Jesse has the smug, one of the most smug confessionals I think we've had in the Amazing Race in quite a while, even beyond Jim and Misty levels of smug smugness. I've snowboarded before, snowboarded before. I think I can do this. I've got excellent grip strength. Aren't I just amazing? Cheesy grin. It's all like, because it's different from other teams who say, oh, you know, I'm a police officer. I should be able to do well at this task. This should be up my alley. That's a bit different because they have expectations that they can do well. But here, I mean, just he's, you know, he's not a professional wakeboarder, and yet he's... Uh, trying to draw a parallel between snowboarding and wakeboarding as if he has the proper prerequisites to do well at the task. Just annoys the crap out of me. I mean, seriously, we are going to be talking about this in a lot more detail in about two weeks' time when we do a post-mortem of the season and what really didn't go well. A post-mortem? Yeah, a post-mortem. Because whilst there are some good bits to this season, spoilers, it's not a classic. It is not going to be in my top ten anytime soon. And I think a lot of that boils down to teams like Gino and Jesse doing well. Because we predicted that they'd do well. I, mean, I think we predicted they'd go out in about 6th place because we thought there'd be a bit more international travel than there was. But uh, the fact that they are almost certainly going to make it to the final leg and hopefully come in a humiliating second to Nick and Matt just doesn't sit well. Did they win any of the four international legs this season? Um, it was Hamilton and Michaela, Neil and Kristen, Dijon and Leilani, Nick and Matt said no. So yeah, four out of the six Canada legs have been won by Gino and Jesse. That shows you, that's, that pretty much goes with what I was saying heading into the season. 
or I think I said that they would do well in the Canada legs, and then once they travel abroad, they wouldn't do as well because it wouldn't be ultra physical tasks that would be pretty much be、uh, mandatory to do within Canada. And when you're traveling through the Okanagan, I mean, it's no surprise that they won this week. That's for sure. Yeah, this was the first week that I cynically put them first, and I'm glad I did because you know, pool king at the moment. But、oh, it, I didn't feel brilliantly clean doing it. It made me feel a little bit icky. Just like the tree that、uh, Sean urinated on on the way to the detour. The technical term is pulling a Tyson. Pulling a Tyson, yes, or releasing a Tyson. It, it depends on the way you look at it. So Gina and Jesse leave the roadblock in first with Brent and Sean in second, Nick and Matt in third, Simeon and Opie in fourth, and Dijon and Leilani in last. That was a painful roadblock for Leilani. Oh God, yeah. That's one of the more painful. That was probably like I don't know which would be worse: getting plastic stuck into your skin and bleeding, or or suffering from hypothermia. Those sound like two very unpleasant experiences. I can't say I didn't predict it because I know how how easy it is to injure yourself in、uh, wakeboarding. They got gloves for some reason, which you know is cheating. I didn't get gloves,、um, and I had blisters on my hands for about two weeks afterwards, just because of how hard it pulls you, basically. And、mm-hmm. I was lucky to just get blisters. It's all grip strength. Like、uh, I've been saying that this is the first season my dad has watched of the Amazing Race in over ten years, and he's sort of the Enthusiast of、uh, strongman contests and strength competitions, and he was loving this week because there were so many tasks that involved grip strength, and that's all he was raving about the whole time. And Nick is as graceful as a pig, apparently. Does that mean he can fly? Spider pig, spider Nick does whatever a spider Nick does. And then Paul breaks him open to find an exemption inside of his body. Is I believe what would happen as well. A Paul Five reference. Yeah, my ringtone is still the Paul Free song. Really? Just for the record, yeah. Seven years later. Yeah, checking through the Andes.、Uh, and once teams complete the roadblock, they must head to Covert Farms in Oliver, BC, to find their next clue. Which was surprisingly easy easy to find, despite the name. I'm not sure if it's named after Oliver Queen or、uh, or Oliver the Musical. It, it wasn't Oliver Exclamation Mark BC, was it? You know what would have been better is if. During this task, they bought they borrow a sponsor from Big Brother Canada and have the Twistos twist and have that Oliver. So it's the Oliver Twistos twist. In fact, we just need Arissa Cox to be a greeter because the first place team is always watching. <laughs> Only if we can have someone terribly flirt with her again. Because <laughs> I can,、uh, I think Brent and Sean would be more than happy to refer to her as the Golden Goddess. If she does appear as a greeter on top four and you're on there, please, please, please call her the Golden Goddess. Just walk up and go, "Hi, Monty. How's the Golden Goddess tonight?" Yeah, or just ignore John Montgomery entirely. <laughs> so once teams find covert farms,、uh, it's a detour which is brains or brawn, and in brains, teams must use a series of coordinates to find three bottles of wine hidden in the vineyard. Then they must fi-、uh, fire potatoes at a target using a slingshot before using a forklift truck to stack ten pallets to receive their next clue. And in brawn, teams must lift ten sixty-five pound sacks of onions onto a truck, then flip a tractor tire a hundred meters down a path, put the tire on a stand, and simultaneously climb a set of monkey bars to receive their next clue. If only, only, if only there was a bunch of little Johns on the monkey bar, so that they could be called Monty bars. And after either side of the detour is completed, teams must、uh, also complete a muddy obstacle course, after which they find the double U-turn and potentially their next clue. Essentially, it's a miniature version of Tough Mudder. Freaking farmer, they called it. Freaking farmer, yes.、Uh, all five of the teams chose voluntarily chose Braun, but yet I'm sure if Amanda Kimmel was on the Amazing Canada, she would have been more than happy to choose Brains. Speaking of the roadblock with how much、uh, Leilani was having trouble, I got to say that you would think that Opie was the one doing the roadblocks of all the over the top reactions he was having. Yeah, Opie had a good week for reactions. It, it's funny because whenever he. Whenever they come from behind to finish a task, Opie's way of celebrating is the exact same way as when my dad celebrates when he wins any sort of game against me, where it's you know just yelling and shouting and then some bad dancing and then everyone just tries to move on with the day. Well, we spent eight weeks saying Simi and Opie are being underrated. Oh my god! Yeah, last week we had his 
well, both of their dance at the roadblock when he completed it. And now we have two sets of amazing reactions to Ropey. One after the roadblock when Simi kicks ass, basically. And he's just, like, fist pumping and really proud of her. And then after the when they get to the U-turn board and find out they're not u turned he just goes mental. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also, before the detour, Brent and Sean will find their speed bump, which is actually not the worst one they've ever done. No, it's no frozen ice chair from Amazing Race 17, that's for sure. It's no untying a knot from Amazing Race 19, either. It's definitely not uh, Ethan and Jenna tying a knot, that's for sure. So, in this speed bump, Brent and Sean must correctly bottle, cook, and label 12 bottles of wine to be able to continue on with the race. And also, even for someone like me with no strength or coordination, those monkey bars did not seem very long. No, those were... That may be the record for the shortest monkey bars I've ever seen, but perhaps after a day like that, if you made the monkey bars any longer, teams may not have been may, may not have been able to even complete the brown side of the detour. They were ten rungs, because I counted. <laughs> they probably could have gotten away with another six rungs. It was... It, you know, the, the saddest part about it is that if you don't have a context for everything that they did during the day, then teams that are falling from them from monkey bars that are 10 rungs really close together, it just looks like the saddest case of coordination ever witnessed on TV. And then the, to top it all off, it's it's cow, it's John and Al's personal favorite, uh, cow manure uh, <laughs> on the ground that they fall into. Yeah, what is it about piles of hot poop basically being on every single 10th episode of Amazing Race Canada? Because this year we had it under the monkey bars. Last year we had Ryan and Rob searching through it in PEI. And uh, the year before that we had the um, the entire final three. <laughs> oh, 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 burn. <laughs> uh, and Brent and Sean have no perception of how heavy, heavy things are as well. <laughs> Seeing Sean... What? It was like a penguin waddle when after he carried the one bag of onions. Did you notice the waddle that he did? Yes. He wasn't even carrying anything. Yeah, I still don't understand why they and Simi and Opie actually picked brawn rather than brains. Because I would have yeah. picked, picked brains. 100%. Because mm-hmm. that seems much more like my sort of thing. Although the forklift was a surprisingly brawnish type of task. Yeah, I didn't get why the forklift was there, but coordinates are going to be very easy especially when actually it's pretty well labelled mm-hmm. and you can just sort of kick along the post until you find a wine bottle anyway <laughs> just start kicking them down saying F you I don't care about your farms kick it to the ground I'm an adult kick the shit out of it and the potato slingshot just looked like fun I might have just done it for the potato slingshot because that looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, the, it's it's the it's a version of the spud gun as seen in the video game Bully, and I believe there's going to be another version of the game Bully coming out next year, the Nicole Arbor edition. And we get for the sixth time this season. Yes, I know how many it is. Uh, Sean puke. Sean puking for the sixth episode. Uh, so Gino and Jesse leave Braun in first, with Nick and Matt leaving Braun in second. And to quote Gino, the hair, we'll worry about that later. That is really just them, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can just skip over them. The, the, the U-turns, Nick and Matt, which we predicted, so... Yeah, but we need to talk about uh, Jesse's shitty tattoos and nipple ring. Yeah, go ahead. The, the floor is all yours, Michael. <laughs> no, it was just a, a one-clip gag that made me laugh. They were just sort of waiting for the... Uh, or explaining their stupid decisions to use Nick and Matt and create a pointless rivalry. And, uh, yeah, we got to find out that Jesse has a shitty tattoo on his shoulder and also a nipple ring. You know you know who else created pointless rivalries? Because uh, we nicknamed them the Voldemort Mussolini's all season long. And correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but Voldemort also picked a pointless rival when he uh, marked Harry Potter as his rival in Godric's Hollow... Uh, you know, shortly after Harry Potter was born. It's Voldemort, according to J.K. Rowling yesterday. The T is silent? Yep, she said yesterday that the T is silent. Well, she was... <laughs> she was uh, about 18 years late with that announcement. You learned something new. So, what language would that... What I mean, you... 
and the name with Voldemort's real name, Tom Riddle, the, the, the T, the T is really emphasized. So when you rearrange it around with Lord Voldemort, why does the T become silent in that case? I'm assuming it's her appropriating French, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you can just imagine with Hermione Granger where in one sentence she's saying, it's not Leviosa, it's Leviosa. And then a sentence later saying, it's not Lord Voldemort, it's Lord Voldemort. <laughs> Fun fact, one of my best friends is a spitting image of Hermione Granger. We actually called her Hermione growing up and she kept hitting us throughout. Because she is like a dead ringer for Hermione Granger and Emma Watson generally. And Emma Watson generally, I love that. So yeah, uh, sadly we have to see Nick and Matt get U-turned by Gino and Jesse, but I did predict it last week, as did you. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nick and Matt, as I predicted, U-turned Dijon and Leilani because they knew they were behind them. Boo. Although there was no other option. I wish that Brent and Sean would have just uh, wasted their uh, U-turn. Not that it would have made any difference whatsoever. No. No, not in this case, no. <laughs> that U-turn was uh, didn't, didn't really uh, factor into the conclusion of this round. So Brent and Sean leave Broad in actual second, thanks to the U-turn. Nick and Matt leave Brains in actual third and get a second mud run for their troubles. Simeon Opa leave Braun in fourth. And Dujan and Leilani originally pick Braun and then decide to switch because she can't do the monkey bars. But then take the penalty anyway. And I wonder if, if Leilani copied Simi's strategy. They could have been somewhat in it. Yeah, then they would have eliminated Simi and Opie, though. And we wouldn't get to see what looks like an amazing fight next week. Although I guess Simi and Opie were probably so far ahead of Dujan and Leilani at that point that even if Leilani did comp- complete the monkey bars, it overall it wouldn't have mattered. Because I'm guessing when medical intervenes like that back in the roadblock, like they're decide they have to they have to assess her and decide whether to pull her from the the task or not, right? And they even brought her back onto the boat. So I'm thinking the time it took after she did 15 attempts or whatever it was, and then she has the injury and she's just stuck there in the water. And they got to bring her back to the boat, assess her, and then stitch her up and everything, and then put her back in the water. I'm guessing that must have cost them at least at least a half an hour. On top of already failing miserably at the task. Yeah, I don't think that they really were that much in it. I haven't seen any exit interviews with them, but I'd hazard a guess that even without the penalty, they would have been 45 an hour behind. And I have to add that all these towns that they visited for this round, because people are probably saying, oh, you know, they visited four towns in one leg between uh, Soyuz, Oliver, Penticton, and Summerlin, with having, you know, at least one task in each of the four cities, that it must have been... You know, that must have been a lot of driving. But really, all these places are within an hour of each other, and they're all located on Highway 97 South. And I know this because I've gone up and down this highway about 20 times in my life. So uh, I know personally that, you know, they're all located right on the highway. So it's it's not too hard to, uh, it's not too difficult to get lost unless you're uh, Brent and Sean. But with them, it wasn't so much being lost on the highway. It was more just taking a quick wrong turn, and then Nick and Matt catching up the five minutes that they were trailing by. Yeah, it's it's a super straight line. Uh, And teams must now drive to the Asayus Model Desert Railroad and find a small figurine of John holding a sign. Once they find him, they'll find the location of the pit stop. What's the name of the figurines? Do you know Jesse called him Little John? Everyone else called him Mini John, I think. Mini John was the official term, I think. What? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> um, and and then uh, then afterwards, when they Gino and Jesse found Little John, then they were gonna go find Big John McCarthy at the pit stop. But instead of Big John, it was just John, a regular John Montgomery. There was nobody at the pit stop to say, "Let's get it on, come on." One bit of credit I will give them is that if this was the US doing this task, the sign would direct them to be like to go like round the side of the building or something to find John at the pit stop. Yeah, it would have been much closer. Yeah, at least they found the sign and then said, you, right, you got to drive there. That's the credit I will give them. Although I did look quite like this leg, actually. Uh, so Gino and Jesse get frustrated at the task, but then spot it soon after, thanks to the power of hugs. The bromance continues. <laughs> Simi keeps headbutting perspex. 
<laughs> oh, it's like a bird trying to get into a window. Oh, it, you know what? It would have been better is if the the task was sponsored by Windex, <laughs> and it's, it's and then they could have said, you know, it, it, it cleans up your window so well that you, you can't even tell it's there. And then just cut to cut to see me just uh, <laughs> bashing her head against the window. Brent and Sean leaving second, Nick and I in third, Simeon OP in fourth, and teams and us now find the Nick Mip Desert Cultural Center, the pit stop for this leg of the race. The last team to check in may well be eliminated. What's even better about Simi hitting her head on the glass is that I can relate because I'm just a clumsy person that way where I'm in, in the sort of a hurry where I've done it so many times where I stub my toe on a table or there has been a few times where I've hit my arm against the side of the door frame and there has been a couple times where I have just hit my head on the on the side of a door going into another room so to see Simi uh, suffer through that was just downright hilarious to me. Hashtag tall people problems because I do exactly the same at 6'5 I am a complete liability <laughs> uh, and in a uh, result that shocks no one, <sighs> Gino and Jesse win their fourth leg of the race I wish they encountered the same snake that Brett and Sean did I think Gino and Jesse need a bit of a scare in their lives. Yeah, as as well as probably winning the coolest uh, coolest prize of the season so far, which is two flights to Tokyo and two years of petrol. Which brings us to a listener question where somebody asked, with Gino and Jesse winning so many years of free gas, um, how does production uh, compensate for that? And I think I found the answer because on the feel your... Uh, favorite contest, the grand prize that the fan receives is a free gas per year, and then if you read the contest details, it says, oh, it's equivalent to, I think the total was $2,266.40 is the value for one year of gas. So, with Gino and Jesse, I assume what's going to happen is that they're going to receive about $4,500 worth of free gas and gift cards for winning this round, and then win the other gift cards accordingly for their previous three uh, victories during this race. Yeah, it's Jerry Dowdy who asked that. Hey, Jerry D. So yeah, they'll, they'll end up getting like four and a half years worth of gas or whatever it is they've won. It should be four and a half years of prison. Yeah, they're only going to win gas for a year, and let's be honest, they're probably going to win unless everyone unites around Dana and Amanda, which would be amazing. I would love that so much. Feel your favourite ghost. Please, everyone, vote for uh, Dana and Amanda. As much as I would love you to vote for Nick and Sabrina, or uh, or Nick and Matt, or Malias, for that matter, or Brian and Cynthia, please vote for Dana and Amanda, just so Gino and Jesse don't win. Or Neil and Kristen, or Susan and Sharnjeet, or or uh, Brent and Sean, or Simi and Opie, or Dushan and Leilani. Uh, and for the second time this season, Sean falls on the way to the pit stop. This time in a foot race with Nick and Matt. <laughs> foot race. It was funny too, because uh, he tumbled in the exact same manner. <laughs> the backpack rolls off and he does a little bit of a roll. Yeah, sadly they didn't have a camera in front of him this time. It was only the back shot. <laughs> At least they have it from all angles now. They can just combine the two. <laughs> yeah, uh, but Brent and Sean hold on for second place, leaving Nick and Matt in third. And John is such a troll. He was so mean to Brent and Sean. Brent and Sean, I have some bad news for you. I'm a Skeletor! Yeah, the only penalty there is probably a slap upside the head by Monty. Monty's coming into his own. He was going to pull out some Monjutsu. I'm not sure where our ranking of him would put him, or our ranking would put him, but he's up there. I think that each host has their own their own pros and cons, to use a detail term. Mm-hmm. I mean, Phil's obviously the OG. Grant Bowler is so grumpy, it's hilarious. And also, no one else has a parody account on Twitter. At Rant Bowler. Who still follows me, by the way. I checked a couple of days ago. And obviously, Monty's up for absolutely anything. And Alan Wu does puns. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like a series of fine lines. It's a, it's a matter of what, what, it, what satisfies your taste. It's fourth with Simeon OP. And last, shocking no one was Dijon Leilani. So, when you get U-turned... Does that mean that you get 12 hours worth of penalties at the detour then? Because you quit the detour and then you go to the U-turn and says, oh, well, you still have to do the other side. Does that mean you get 12-hour penalty? I would think so, because yeah, it's essentially two tasks 
that you have to complete. And so the, cause with a regular detour, you just have to complete one of them. And I think the reason why the penalty is higher is because at least you have the choice, but you're ignoring both choices. But here you're assigned to do two tasks and complete both sides of the detour, and you're not doing any of any of them. So I would think the penalty is probably 12 hours, and then I'm guessing when they officially decided to quit, rather than make them wait 12 hours at the detour location, and then knowing that you know nightfall is coming, and the storm was coming as well, and then Simi and Opie were... <coughs> We're probably having their production crew call in and say, hey, we're only minutes away from the pit stop. I would think at that point that production gave the go-ahead to just take Dujan and Leilani straight to the pit stop. It's too bad they don't even get to find a little Monty, you know, to quote Matt, uh, how many redheads can there be? Uh, and Dijon Leilani, Leilani, unfortunately, did not get to find that redhead. I would assume that they got two six-hour penalties, but then again, they might have completed Brains off it. If they completed Brains and we didn't see it, which has happened in the US before, then it would have only been a six-hour penalty. But also, it didn't look like they completed the... Did did they complete the mud, mud run? They didn't show them even going through it, so I'm guessing they just walked around it to the U-turn board, because I'm guessing when you quit the detour... You really just get to bypass everything, right? So they probably didn't have to do any part of the task, and I would assume if the mud runs part of the task, then they just get to walk around it. Although you're still going to be walking in mud anyways when it's when the storm is coming. That looked like a pretty bad storm as well. Yeah, the Okanagan is known for some pretty harsh uh, thunder and lightning storms uh, throughout the summer, and they can start as early as May, and they... Typically go through till the middle of October, knowing from personal experience. So, next time, Glorious Edmonds in Alberta. Teams are stepping back in time, there's another double battle, and teams fight literally for a place in the final three. Are we going to mourn Dijon Leilani's terrible, terrible round of play? Because this was, this was I think this was a fairly noteworthy uh, collapse of a team. A team that was... Very strong, won two rounds, and had a very strong winner's edit, I would say. And they didn't seem to bicker too much during the first nine rounds, and everything just went wrong this round. Yeah, I I did say it last week, that the reason I was putting them last is because it looked like they were fighting heavily. And X's teams, especially who fight heavily, do not do well on that round. Mm Mm-hmm. So, that was why I, I gambled with putting them in last. Because I thought, hmm, if Gino and Jesse are ahead of the U-turn, then and Nick and Matt are forced to U-turn someone, they'll probably go for someone who's the biggest target who they know is behind them. Which is correct, but... Do you think they would have uh, at least completed the... Do you think Leilani would have tried harder at the monkey bars if, say, Dujon wasn't being a complete uh, douchebag? I love how we got our first fight where, like, half of Leilani's words were just blacked out. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if weren't such a douchebag, I would try and complete this detour. He was pushing her pretty hard. Just thinking back to the wakeboarding task, she's got plastic in her leg, it's being wrapped up, she's bleeding, she's failed at it 20 times, and she's still trying to get up when she's got probably a ton of blisters on her hands. And I'm guessing that even though D- Dujon can't swim... I would take the leap to say that, much like Simi, she probably doesn't swim too much more than her partner, because usually if you're together that much, you would have a lot of the same overlapping uh, strengths and weaknesses. And I think Leilani probably didn't really want to be in the water, but thought, oh, you know. Uh, Well, it was the same thing with Nick and Sabrina as well, where Nick was the one pure pull of water, so Sabrina had to do it. So... uh, I think with Leilani, she probably thought with volunteering for a roadblock that obviously hinted at water, and she had to bleed and get plastic in her body to uh, complete it, that uh, you would probably be pretty pissed if your partner, who you knew couldn't do it at all, is just cussing you out and making fun of your performance and saying they could have done it better than you when you didn't want to do it at all in the first place. Can you imagine Nick and Sabrina doing these tasks? I know we say that every week. But, oh my god, Sabrina doing the wakeboarding. Oh, such a missed opportunity. Yeah, if it was if Nick and Sabrina and Dujan Leilani had a face, or if it was Dujan, Opie, 
and Nick all having to do this task together, that probably would have been the biggest highlight of the season. Because Nick can't even put his face in water. Maybe in the moment, uh, you know, maybe in the moment they don't really think about the who likes to get wet hint, and then Nick just volunteers for it himself. I could see it where, you know, all three of those guys trying to duke it out are, <laughs> maybe all three of them end up taking the penalty. Who knows? Also, something that I uh, I do need to mention, next week teams don't even get a choice of who's doing the roadblock. Why is that? Because of the roadblock requirements that mean that everyone has to do six roadblocks before the final leg of the race. It does mean that we are going to, regardless of anything else, see Matt, Gino, uh, Brent and Opie having to do the final roadblock, or the, this roadblock. Because I'm assuming we're going to have a double roadblock leg in the final leg again. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good guess, I would say. Has, that, has it been like that in the first two season finales, where it's two roadblocks at the end? Yeah, because last season we had the winching yourself up the atrium, mm-hmm. and we had the Defen bunker. And season one was the memory challenge, and... But yeah, please, please, can we have a final memory challenge that is a roadblock? Because they're always better ones... Just, mm-hmm. just whilst I think about it, I know you like making it fair and letting both sides of a team complete the final memory challenge like last year, but it's less interesting, because if one person has to do that final memory challenge, and it is a rock-hard one, which I'm not expecting, I've heard rumours that it's going to be country outlines again, because apparently they've appeared on some of the clues or territory and province outlines as well. If that is true, then it's not going to be a particularly difficult final memory challenge, but you know, give us a fun final memory challenge that's a roadblock and someone can screw it up for their team, preferably Gino or, or Jesse, and I'll be happy. Don't feel the guns. But yeah, with Leilani, yeah, it's a bit of a shame that Dujan Leilani had to go down like this, where I'm hoping that their legacy isn't that they're viewed as quitters or anything, because Leilani had to suffer with a not-so-supportive partner after doing a task she uh, would not want to do whatsoever. And then, and a task that involved the grip strength, you know, having so many blisters on her hands and then having to do things like lifting heavy bags of onions and then flipping tires, which is all in your hands too, and then doing monkey bars to end it all and falling into cow manure several times and then your partner insisting that you quit. Uh, you know, I, I think we got to cut little Leilani a lot of slack here, not really label her in the same way as other teams in Amazing Race history who have forfeited the race. The first roadblock in Amazing Race Canada 1's uh, final leg was the angel dive down the L Tower as well. Mm. Uh, so we've got quite a lot of listener questions to get through. Okay. So we'll start with Diana Hill Hodges who says, my question is how long do they have to get their passport ready and shots? Not, long Not a whole lot of time. Yeah, <laughs> it's about two weeks, I think, at most. Yeah, it's a really quick turnaround, I know, with the packages that they send you, and that pretty much applies to any reality show where it's almost a test to see how badly you want to be on there because they give you such a ridiculously short amount of time from what I've heard in certain cases that you're just scrambling to put it all together. Like, uh, it's you know, you don't put your life on hold just for the duration of the race. You're putting your life on hold weeks before you even go out on location, even before sequester. And also weeks after as well, because using Logan as as an example, if Logan was cast on the Major Race Canada 4, he would have to then sneakily tell us that he couldn't do podcasts for the season and wouldn't be able to do a Major Race Canada 4 podcast with us as well. Wouldn't that be hilarious to me trying to come up with an excuse for why I'm disappearing for a great amount of time from the internet when I haven't done that in about... Ever. <laughs> yeah, the, the difference is, you would send me one message and I would go, no, Logan, just tell me your own talk. And then I couldn't tell you. I could, I could not tell you. I would keep the secret. I would come up with something pretty believable, though. I would think some people would be, a, one, just be like, oh, that's so transparent. Uh, yeah, I'd see through it. I'd be like, yeah, Logan, you would have told me months ago if you were going away for that length of time. But yeah, it's like, I think filming time for the season was close to four weeks. Yeah, I... <laughs> The the American one is they seem to boast about 12 shows 21 days for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't think it'll have been that far away for uh, for talk. Yeah, I think it's just a little I think it's a little bit over 21 days for Amazing Race Canada. 
Uh, and Linda Pierce says, with all the different athletic tasks and roadblocks, etc., what do you think is essential to train for if you got on talk? Swimming and driving a stick, for sure. Yeah, that's pretty much the answer. Um, also, take notes of everything you see along the race course, because you don't know what's going to appear in a memory challenge. Um, just learn skill, basic skills in life that you haven't, for whatever reason, found to be relevant as of yet. So things like, like for me, I don't really bike at all. I still have to learn how to ride a bike, but I'm going to be trying my darndest to ride a bike before I get out there and uh, and then reading maps as well. I probably wouldn't go to the same extreme as Dennis and Isabel from Season 25 where I joined CrossFit as well just for the race, but it's little things that you don't really think about that you might be terrible at that you want some sort of basic guideline on how to do it. Yeah, like reading a map or reading a compass. Changing a flat tire, that might be really high up on the list. Just um, even probably more uh, probably more handyman stuff would probably be ideal. Because there's sort of some spatial and construction-related things that you have to do during almost any season of the race. And apparently if you're participating in Amazing Race Canada, uh, a must for at least five tasks in every season so far has involved dancing, so... Go join a dance class because physical memory with dances on the race is always going to come into play. And tying a knot as well. Tying a knot, I know that comes under handyman skills, but that is something you need to learn. Mm -hmm. How to properly tie a knot. But yeah, driving a car is crucially important. For at least one of you. Well, no, for both of you. Because Sod's Law will state that you'll pick the wrong roadblock. And the person who can't drive a car and doesn't know how to drive a car will almost certainly get that roadblock. Hmm. So you need to at least have a basic understanding of how to drive a manual car for both team members, just in case. Because I, I know if you got on talk, you wouldn't be doing most of the driving, but as long as you had a working knowledge of how to drive a car, just in case. Just in case you got like a tank roadblock or that sort of thing. We got one from Kurt Reptil who says, "What do you think of the West Coast hippie who was helping Matt and Nick at the wakeboarding task? I love his reaction to the Graceful as a pig comment. Another scene stealing extra." Oh, we completely scene. skipped over the the guy at the wakeboarding. What was his name? James. His name was James. Well, no, James was a different guy. We didn't actually get a name for the for the guy who was helping Nick and Matt. Then who was James? James was the wakeboarding instructor, the guy who was in blue next to Monty. Who was saying, "Oh yeah." <laughs> yeah, the uh, the guy Kurt's talking about was the guy on Nick and Matt's boat who was wearing sort of lime green. Oh, and just absolutely peeing. Was he himself. the one saying Grace was a pig? Was he the one that said it? No, Matt said it, but he was the one peeing himself when Matt said it. So he's like a hype man almost. I like the long hair that he had. That was uh, such a BC thing. <laughs> long hair, I don't care. Yeah, my man Bun can attest to that. So what do we think is going to happen next week? Next week, well... They're going to another place that I've been to before, Edmonton. Um, I hear there may or may not be a guy who is somewhat known in the Amazing Race Canada community that makes a cameo. Um, possibly, yeah, from, from what I've heard, yeah. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Wayne? I think it's Wayne. Seriously, Wayne's in it and nobody's told me. No, no, it's, it's in all seriousness, it's Gord. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Nobody actually told me this. Yeah, there's a screen cap of Gord in the preview for next week. Apparently it's that they're going to the Fort Edmonton or whatever it's called, and Gord is, he. I guess he volunteers there regularly, and he's, yeah, he's, he's there. It's a, yeah, Wayne screen captain of Gord in the preview. Okay, I need to go back and have a look at this. Because one of Wayne's questions was, what do you think of Gord being in the next episode? So After Wayne sent that in, I did go back and look at the actual wording bit of the credits because I thought that they'd named him or something in it. No. No, he's he's in the credits for in the preview for next episode. It's definitely Gord. Does this mean that we get to take the piss out of him next week? <laughs> I think he's only sh shown as like a background guy. I don't think he gets any speaking lines in it. Since when does that stop us? <laughs> that's true. That's that's a very good point. A very good point, Michael. So yeah, God, we'll get, we'll spend about five minutes talking about you next Saturday. Well, yeah, it's either that or we talk about Gino and Jesse. So 
With only four teams left, her options are limited. That so sucks to be you. <laughs> but yeah, um, I haven't been to Edmonton in about uh, 11 years. My oldest brother, who the, the wrestling brother, yeah, uh, he would compete in the world's competition there. So I got to check out Edmonton for about three or four days back in 2002. I got to miss the last week of grade five because of it, because of that uh, trip to Alberta. And yeah, four days was spent in Edmonton. So it'll be neat to see any familiar places. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to be like in early May, though, because winter in Alberta, as you know, full no- uh, well know from personal experience, Michael, you know, winter starts really early during the year, and uh, it can... Go on for a, for a long time. Yeah, given that this week is the anniversary of when I flew to Canada last year, I was telling that story a couple of days ago. If no one has heard this before, I flew to Canada last last year, still did the podcast, met up with Logan nearly a year ago, year on Sunday. And we landed in Calgary, it was about 25 degrees, I was in shorts. The next morning I woke up to a freak snowstorm, it was 3 degrees and an absolute blizzard. Mm-hmm. And not even the Dairy Queen kind, and Mickey and Pete weren't making it for you. Arguably, I was happy about it because it made Banff look very pretty in the snow, but mm-hmm. it was a bit of a surprise for a 22 degree drop overnight. In the middle of September, when it's still technically summer. Yeah, in the middle of September, when we'd flown to Toronto at the same time type of year, a couple of years beforehand, and it was like boiling hot all week. And then you came over to Vancouver the day that you were in Banff when it was snowing. And by the time you got to Vancouver, we met up there. Yeah. And it was 30 degrees Celsius. And even though Vancouver's notorious for rain, it did not rain the whole weekend in Vancouver. It didn't. And it was very nice. Yeah. And we had Tim Hortons because it's Canada. What do we think is going to happen next week? Oh, All right, we got off topic. We started talking about ourselves. I'm sure. I'm sure everybody else is entertained by this thoroughly. Outside of Gord appearing. Outside of Gord's appearance. Um, Sorry, Gord's glorious appearance. Gord's, gl- Gord's glory? <laughs> We're not talking about Gord's glory. Please, God, no. Uh, sounds like the name of an Edmonton sports team, the Gord's glories. Um, anyways, anyways, okay. Um, for next week, uh, Gino and Jesse... Probably going to finish first. Uh, remember, they have roots in Alberta, so we'll be hearing about that nonstop. And with the Curly, we have a face-off next week, the, the second and presumably final face-off of the season in Curling, no less, which reminds me of a crappy Canadian movie um, that was parodied in The Simpsons. So Gino and Jesse will use their snowboarding experience because that's also a winter sport just like Curling, so they're going to use that to... Uh, do well, and I assume they won't be doing a whole lot else in Edmonton. Maybe hit up the West Edmonton Mall. That's the only other thing I can really... That's the funny thing with Edmonton is that when I was there, there wasn't too many places to go. It was more... You have to travel more throughout Alberta to hit up a lot of the touristy spots, and they've already done that with the trip to Calgary and Drumheller in Season 1, so I think with Edmonton they won't find too much to do, so I think it'll be physical tasks that Gino and Jesse will excel at. Um, the rivalry will probably have to keep up, so Nick and Matt are probably going to survive the round. And Here's where we differ, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and this is where we differ. I think I don't think it's going to be an all-male final three, which I don't know if that's ever happened in any international season where it's been an all-male final three. And I don't know either. And I think... I think Brett and Sean are getting the same fan favorite slash big stars go home in fourth place that we've seen, you know, countless number of times in Amazing Race history. So I think Brett and Sean are going to be going to commit some sort of major blunder next week and go home in fourth. And I think Sammy and Opie are going to squeak into that finale. Yeah, I, I've i thought for a couple of weeks it's going to be an all-male final three purely because Simi and Opie's storyline has basically ended. What do you mean it's ended? They haven't really had a storyline to begin with. Well, exactly. They haven't got an active storyline left. Nick and Matt and Gino and Jesse still have their feud, which probably means that they're going to be the top two. Hopefully Nick and Matt will beat them, because I will be so unbelievably hard on this season if Gino and Jesse are our winners, especially with the edit that they've got. And Brent and Sean still have the running joke of 
both him puking his way around the entire race course and also the fact that they have said multiple times that they want to make the final three. It's just so weird to picture Brent and Sean as the winners of this season. After everything that's gone down with their... Like with Mickey and Pete with last year, they sort of... Editors made us legitimize their presence by quite a bit with finishing in the top three for seven legs in a row leading up to the finale and being worthy competitors to Nally and Megan. But with Brent and Sean, you know, we've seen them... They're almost edited as buffoons at times with uh, their performance. I just can't see them winning. No matter what, regardless of who gets eliminated next week, I suspect the other team, either Brent and Sean or Simeon Opie, will be third place. There is no way that I can see either of those teams getting second or higher. I think it would be a pretty hilarious ending, though, if with the rivalry pumped up all season long, if both Nick and Matt and the Valdi Mussolinis crumble in the final round. It would be hilarious, but, you know, Nick and Matt are my boys and have been for a couple of weeks since Brian and Cynthia went, so I've got to root for them. You're my boy, Blue. And also no one else is getting sassy with me on Twitter anymore. Yeah. (laughs) Which is indeed a prerequisite for being one of my favourite teams. It's being sassy with me on Twitter. Or being nice to me on Twitter like Nick and Sabrina. So anything else to add about this week before we take a, or go for a double podcast week next week? Yeah, no, no whole lot else to talk about. I believe Edmonton's going to be the final provincial slash territorial slash national capital that the Mason Race Canada has yet to visit. So I think this is the last major city for a Mason Race Canada to knock off its checklist. And I, I would like to actually, there, this was something I wrote down too, that with visiting four different smaller towns this round here in the Okanagan, that I think if next season is going to be a Canadian heavy season again, where it's going to be eight rounds, I think what could happen is that that could be the new model where each round is just combining three or four of the smaller towns and they just do that each leg and then re- repeat the occasional big city. I could see that them taking that direction. It would be the wrong direction, but I think that's the only way the show can really work anymore if they want to make it... Canada's race, so to speak. So, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back next week for another Amazing Race Canada recap episode and also a Amazing Race 27 preview episode. What? I know. Are we that close to the new season? We are. We have... Guess how oh, many... we're not even done with this season. I know. Guess how many days break we have between them, Logan? Two? None! Oh. None. Yeah, because Wednesday the 23rd we have the Tark finale as well as the Survivor Premiere and Big Brother finale, which, thanks to that CTV, that's really helpful. Yeah. Plus the reunion special. Plus the It's re- going to be, it's 90 minutes of Big Brother, 90 minutes of Survivor, and then two hours of race and reunion show, so my PVR is essentially screwed. Yeah, and my entire day is essentially screwed as well as the fact that we then have the recap episode on the 25th or 24th evening for you but the 25th for me and then the evening of the 25th is the preview or the premiere of amazing race 27 and then the following day me you ben and michelle will all be back to recap it that's a crazy week if you enjoyed the show and even if you didn't please subscribe to us on the itunes and give us a like on everything and if you want to see what we're rambling about this week, our Twitters are in the descriptions everywhere as well. And if you missed our interview with Mike and Michelle from Major X26, it's also available on iTunes, which you can find linked in the video if you're watching that way as well. Thank you again. Hashtag 250, hashtag super cool, wacky, hashtag yet and cast, hashtag um, whatever the hell we, we hashtag as well. Peace. Peace out. Eight out. Yeah!